and get started. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to the United Way's 2021 Texas Legislative Session Preview. I am Laura Hernandez-Holmes. I am proud to be a co-chair of the Women United Executive Committee, and I'm proud to be here with you all today. You know, of course, as you know, for 95 years, United Way has worked to bring people and ideas and resources together to fight poverty in our community. And we do this by creating large scale systems change that leads to long term solutions. So of course, you know, the economic fallout from COVID-19 and the pandemic has made our work fighting poverty even more important, more than, more than ever. And I, I know we wouldn't be here today without the, the work of the good people in, in this Zoom room. I'd like to take a moment to just recognize the people who are here. We have members from the United Way Board of Directors. We have members from Tocqueville United, as well as Women United and the Emerging Leaders. And we're so thankful for each and every one of you for making the commitment that you all have made to making Austin a more equitable place for, for everyone. You know, I'm thrilled to have these three public servants, public officials here with me today um, to, to, to discuss what's coming up in the 2021 legislative session. And I hope that we can learn from this conversation uh, and, and not only about an understanding of the upcoming legislation and session and the issues ahead, but we leave inspired to advocate for policies that will help make Austin a better place for everyone. So I wanna, I wanna start by introducing our representatives. First, we have Representative John Sirier. He represents District 17, which is uh, Caldwell County, Bastrop and the surrounding counties. He's chairman of the Texas Sunset Advisory Commission, which reviews state agencies to make government more effective and efficient. He also chairs the House Committee on Culture, Recreation, and Tourism, which has jurisdiction over state parks and wildlife preservation and fishing industry. So we're really, uh, we're really happy for your service there, Representative, because you know a lot of us are spending more time at our state parks during the pandemic. And he has led the effort to place a constitutional amendment on the 2019 ballot that dedicated existing sporting goods tax to our state parks and our historic sites. And that Prop 5 passed with 88% of the statewide vote and will now be a secure, reliable funding source for our parks and historical sites. Uh, you know, Representative Syrie was a, a founding member of a, of a board member of the Central Texas Food Bank and Caritas of Austin. And he and his wife, Rochelle, live on their ranch outside of Lockhart. And for my Aggie friends out there, uh, this Aggie alum is a licensed pilot. And you can often see him overhead in the cockpit of his vintage 1941 Stearman biplane. So that's pretty cool. Rep Syria, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Of course, of course. Next, we have my home representative, Donna Howard. Now, Rep. Howard has served in the Texas House since 2006. She's a member of the very important House Appropriations Committee. Thank you for your service on that critical committee. She sits on the subcommittee, which oversees education spending in the state budget. Rep. Howard is a longtime member also of the Higher Education Committee. She's a native Austinite, and she earned her bachelor's degree in, her, in nursing and her master's degree in health education at UT Austin. She worked as a critical care nurse at Brackenridge and Seton Hospitals, and she served as Austin's first hospital-based patient education coordinator. Now, she has served on many boards in, in town, including Austin Area Interreligious Ministries, Common Cause Texas, the Texas Freedom Network, and the Texas Campaign to Prevent Teen Pregnancy. Now she serves as a board member of the Expanding Horizons Foundation, supporting low-income housing and education. Rep. Howard, I'm so proud to call you my state representative. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Laura. I think you couldn't find some kind of a cute little tidbit like me. I don't fly, but... <laughs> I can't compete with Syria. You know that's. Uh, how about how about you have th you have six perfect grandchildren? Oh, and the seventh one will be here any minute now. So wow! <laughs> oh my gosh! Congratulations! Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, so 
next up, we have my very good friend and one of my bosses, Representative Celia Israel. Rep Israel was elected to the legislature in 2014. She serves on the House Committee on Homeland Security and Public Safety and the House Committee on Elections. She and her office are, are some of the, the premier experts in the Capitol on making voting easier for all Texans. She serves as the vice chair of the Texas House Democratic Caucus, overseeing, overseeing the steering and policy committee. And she serves as chair of the Texas House Democratic Campaign Committee. She, like I, was raised in El Paso and we got here to Austin uh, to attend the University of Texas at Austin and, and never left. She graduated with a degree in government. She served in Governor Ann Richards' administration, tasked with recruiting the best and the brightest to public service. She is a licensed realtor here in Austin who lives with her longtime partner, Celinda, and their two adorable puppies, Libby and Kia. Rep. Israel, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Laura. Look forward to the discussion. Absolutely. So, if, of course, you know, the United Way policy agenda addresses the root causes of poverty through support of our three focus areas, education, health, and financial stability. And this session is no different, and I would submit an even more critical time for United Way volunteers and allies to weigh in and make your voices heard on these issues during the legislative session. Some of the priorities this session for United Way will be, you know, continued advocacy of the Success by Six initiative, which provides for early quality childcare that has proven benefits to a child's ability to learn and build healthy relationships and thrive. Another issue is advocating for funding through Medicaid expansion, pre-K and reading academy programs, and increasing capacity of home-based family support through family support services and early childhood intervention. But we know this is going to be an extremely challenging legislative session as state leaders grapple with the pandemic and budget shortfalls. So I wanna pose this first question to all of our panelists. Like many things in life, the 2021 legislative session will look different because of COVID-19. It's been nine months since we've been home and socially distancing. Everyone has been impacted in many ways. Can you all talk about the pan how the pandemic has affected families with young children and what specific legislative priorities may have an impact on these families? And I'll just go ahead and, and start, how about with Representative Howard? Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, it's almost like where to begin, you know. The, I think we all recognize the fact that there were, there were inequities throughout the systems uh, of support uh, for a long, long time, probably forever. Um, but this has really brought them uh, to, into focus for everybody. Uh, clearly, uh, we saw the, uh, the real impacts to our economic uh, well-being when we don't have access to childcare, when children aren't able to be in school. Um, that is a, a huge challenge. And um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that we're gonna find a way to address some of that in the upcoming session in terms of, of making sure that we invest in our childcare programs and provide the support needed to get those open and running. Many, many are still closed, as you know, right now. Um, I, my, I know that uh, we've been working with United Way on a lot of these issues. And I know that Kathy McCorse and I were both on the, the uh, reopening, uh, the Austin Chambers reopening business uh, task force. And, and Kathy was really instrumental in making sure that everybody looked at childcare across all the industries. And quite frankly, that was what was identified. Childcare and uh, internet connectivity were the two big items that crossed every single industry that we were, were looking at there. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's just gonna be critical that we, we get these things in place. So I, my understanding from what the we learned at the chamber is 35 to 40% of all jobs lost are not coming back. We're gonna have to retrain people but we also have to make sure that they have the supports they need to get that retraining. And that's gonna be childcare, that's gonna be stipends. Um, we're gonna be working with the Texas Workforce Commission to see what we can do there. 
uh, community colleges. Austin Community College actually said that even though there's been a 9% drop in community college enrollments nationally, they're actually up 1%. So, you know, people are seeing that there's, it's a time to, to redirect, to retrain. Um, but CHIP, our, medic, our program for children uh, that are not part of the Medicaid program, but in the CHIP program, uh, my understanding is that that had been declining for years. And after March, it shot straight up because we know that we need to get that coverage for our kids and people are trying desperately to find how do they get their kids coverage. Um, it's gonna be a, a huge challenge right now. We have a, an increased match from the federal government, which is helping, but we don't know how long we're gonna have that. Hopefully it will be renewed uh, with the new administration and we can keep moving forward with that. But you know, this is a real struggle for all families right now. When you, when you see that we had probably over a million families that fell into that eligibility gap uh, for Medicaid expansion prior to COVID, and it's definitely over 2 million now, uh, we have a lot of challenges ahead. And if we have an opportunity to talk about the budget in particular, I'm happy to do that because uh, you know, I think that we're in a position to find ways to pay for these things without just immediately looking at cutting. This is not the time to be cutting services to Texans. They need our support. They need to be able to get back to work and get our economy moving forward. But that means we have to have certain things in place. Yeah, I appreciate those, those remarks, Representative Howard. Representative Sirier, how about from your perspective, you're representing the families out in, in Bastrop, Caldwell, the surrounding counties. Yeah, I have, uh, I represent five counties in District 17, uh, Lee, Bathrop, Caldwell County, where I live in Lockhart, Gonzales, and Carnes. So uh, pretty, pretty good stretch there that, yeah, you know, and, and the one thing that I remind myself and of course others is just, you know, this truly is, you know, it's not like it's, it was a hurricane that hit the, the, the coastal area of Texas. I mean, this is not just Central Texas that's going through this. Obviously, it's not just a state, but the whole world. It's just amazing, you know, that once you start thinking through this and the, the magnitude of it, you know, just like uh, Representative Howard said, you, you know, where do you start? Uh, it seems like every day you find something new that you never imagined was going to be affected, was affected, or is being affected. So I, I think the real challenge is, you know, as legislators and, and these other two have heard me say this before, is just, you know, we, we have got to get back to work uh, as, 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 representatives and, and senators, we, the legislature needs to get back and start figuring this out. We have, um, uh, you had mentioned the, the uh, Sunset Commission. We, we meet, typically we meet during the interim and, and uh, there's 21 agencies, departments that are up this uh, cycle. And uh, a lot of our work is done during the interim. And it's been a struggle just even having those uh, interim hearings uh, to get the Sunset uh, so my, my concerns, and I know everybody's shaking their head on this, uh, that you know we, we, we have got to figure out how to get back into the Capitol and, and start start attacking these uh, these real challenges that we're all facing. And it and, and it's and it's tough. And it's you know it's when when these things happen, if it is a natural disaster, which we're uh, used to in the state of Texas, uh, you know it, it, it just like this one, it, it it affects the most vulnerable, and those are the ones that are really suffering through this. And that's what we've got to start focusing on. And um, but I also, too, just feel like there's opportunities. Uh, you know, Donna, you mentioned at the very end there, you know, that now people are looking at different things. I know we're going to talk more about broadband, rural broadband. That was a big, big push last session. Uh, obviously, uh, in my district, in the rural areas of Texas, it's even more so uh, an issue because of just the, the, the abilities to get it. But like in any type of uh, challenge, it, it's risen to the top of, of Top of mind awareness, and it's not just us in the rural areas that are having a hard time getting it, but it's you know everywhere in the state of Texas. How how important it is to have that internet connection for quality of life, uh, if it's healthcare to obviously with education and others. So I I feel like like several of the other important uh, issues, uh, you know, uh, connectivity is going to be a, a topic that everybody will understand and appreciate even more after this. Uh, the uh, you know there, there's there's other issues though too that that came across and you know you mentioned our, our park system and you know obviously I've been focused on Texas Parks and Wildlife and you know we're fortunate that we have such a great 95 state parks uh, throughout our state because they they literally got uh, loved to death uh, during this pandemic and, you know the green space uh, being able to get outdoors for mental health uh, was was critical during this time. And again, I just bring that up just because it's one of those things that most people don't think about 
until until you go through something like this. So, uh, so yeah, so many many challenges. But I know you you know here especially in Central Texas, we've got such great a great team and coalition of uh, representatives and work well together. We've got a new senator. I overlap uh, in Bastrop County. I overlap with what used to be Senator Watson's seat. Of course, we were so fortunate to have. Senator Watson and that and that and work with him, but uh, you know with Sarah Eckhart, I've, I've also got a great relationship with her. Worked with her when she was a uh, actually county commissioner, and worked with her on Campo for many years and other activities when I was a county commissioner in Caldwell County. So looking forward, we've already uh, jumped in, and of course she's she is a uh, quick quick learner and super smart. So uh, excited about that that relationship because I have to admit we were a little all concerned about when Watson was leaving. Uh, what what big big shoes or big boots that was going to be to fill? But now I look look forward to continuing this conversation. Representative Israel, how about from from your perspective in Travis County and also you know serving on the the policy committee in the, in the caucus? Well, Laura, when it comes to young kids, I think of course about um, school kids, and um, I've been meeting with the school district leadership and teachers and PTA groups around the area. Uh, my, my district includes uh, Pflugerville, Maynard, Round Rock, Austin ISD. And um, uh, schools have been dipping into their reserves if they have any to respond to this crisis. And um, we've lost kids, like we, they moved. We don't know where they are. To, uh, they're having to do new and creative things to find the kids again and encourage them and say, you're missed, you're needed. Um, and, um, you know, the, the focus on, on star testing, which is always stressful. I'm glad to see that we're, we're kind of easing up on that a bit so that we can just treat this as, as an emergency that's not just, it's not going to be over for, for kids uh, once the vaccines are distributed to everybody. There's, a, there's, a, there's always a, a worry amongst educators that there's a summertime slide. And now the, the, the phrase that I'm hearing is there's a COVID slide. And it's big, uh, it's dramatic, and it's going to take us a while to get to get back to uh, get back on track with our kids and their and their reading and their accountability and their socialization again. And um, I can't imagine how difficult it is for for those who care for our kids to do um, half the kids virtually, half the kids in the classroom, and uh, for kids are stressed out too. So uh, I'm most concerned about that COVID slide, and I think that this legislature will be evaluated at the end of the day by did we did we stand firm on the on the on the increases that we made two years ago well last fall at the and, and that legislative cycle um to uh to really support our public school system so um that that includes pre-k that includes the daycare supports and the schools doing these creative things um there's federal money that's um, still to be spent. Um, we're sending out a letter today, to the, hopefully with a lot of members on board to the governor to say, with whatever is left in that CARES money, please give it back to the schools who have been um, adjusting. So my, when I think about young kids and COVID, um, that it's that COVID slide that is a greatest concern. And I say that as a mother of two dumb dogs. You know, I don't, I don't, <laughs> they're, they're not going to amount to much. So my, my feedback is just coming from, um, school uh, leadership and parents. They're very concerned and that's all mine. Yeah, well, and, and really that's a great segue into our, our next question. Thank you, Rep. Israel. You know, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about House Bill 3 from uh, last session and, and Representative Howard, um, you know, I'd like to ask you this question. Of course, House Bill 3 was the, the greatly needed school finance bill, right? Um, that provided more money for, for schools, um, increased teacher compensation, reduced recapture and, and, and cut local taxes, right? So I would love to hear for, from you about, um, you know, any, any progress after House Bill 3 was passed um, last session, specifically with public education and, and then now heading into the 2021 session, how do we protect those gains that we made from House Bill 3? Yeah, House Bill 3 was uh, really historic. Um, it was um, a bipartisan effort, uh, a real working effort on the part of the legislature um, to make sure that we had more funding going to public education. And this was without a court demanding that we do that. 
so I think that there were a lot of reasons that happened, one of which was I think we had a more um, moderated legislative body following the 2018 elections that allowed us to, to focus on, on something as important as public education and not get sidetracked with some more of the politically divisive things that we sometimes get involved with. So that was a real positive. And the fact that we had the entire legislature uh, you know, walking together through this and coming up with something that we could all support, I think is going to bode well, as well as we can, this upcoming session, and that nobody wants to go back on what we worked so hard to accomplish last time. And the fact is that we did put in an, a, over $6 billion into actual direct funding to schools with a, a revised uh, formula funding, uh, with some special monies for some special needs populations with teacher uh, pay, with uh, TRS contributions, uh, a real wide ranging package of, of increased investments that were sorely needed. Now, I won't say that it brought us to a huge uh, increase in where we were, uh, it, where we should have been. Uh, it got us back up to where we were pretty much before the uh, big budget cuts of, of 2011. So again, we do not want to go back to what we did then. It's taken us years to catch up. Um, the, there was additional $5 billion that went to property tax relief. Uh, by that, it meant that the state was on the hook for $5 billion more dollars and to be more of an equal partner in how we... Um, provide uh, the funding for public education. So here we are with a budget that we left last session with a $3 billion surplus. The comptroller revised the estimate now to a $4.6 billion shortfall for the current two years that we're in, which is the current two years is when HB3 started. Um, so, you know, we, we are finding ways to plug some of the holes in this current session this current two-year biennium, but when we come back for session in January and craft the next two-year budget, we do not know what the revenue estimate is going to be yet from the comptroller, but he's given all indications that it's going to be a big challenge. That means we have to find a way to maintain the funding that we put in this uh, budget, and we did not really create new revenue streams to support it. So we're going to have to be willing to have discussions about how can we find sustainable revenue streams that can work towards supporting public education. As, as Celia mentioned, we've got the COVID slide going on. This is not something that's gonna change overnight and we have, we're gonna have some real big challenges now to help our kids get back up to speed. So, um, you know, uh, I, the fact is that we were making progress toward our higher education goals of 60 by 30 Texas. We're sliding back on that. Kids are not gonna be prepared. I mean, this is really talking about our educated workforce pipeline. If we want to maintain our economy, we have got to invest in education and make sure that pipeline continues to function. So, you know, uh, there, there are some options we're looking at for revenue, but um, it's gonna, there's no low hanging fruit. Uh, so this is going to be a real challenge for us. We're going to be able to have to look at using some of our uh, economic stabilization fund, also known as the rainy day fund. There's going to be a lot of money, uh, close to $9 billion in that. I probably won't spend all of it, but we should be able to spend a big chunk of that to make sure we don't slide back on, on education this time like we did in 2011. So it's going to be a real challenge. I think that we've got a lot of bipartisan effort, though, to make sure we find ways to support it. So I'm hopeful. Uh, that we're going to be able to work together and find some solutions to maintain. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Howard. I really appreciate that. You know, and, and earlier in, in the discussion, we, we focused on, on child care facilities, right, and the, and the hit that uh, child care facilities have, have taken in this pandemic. You know, Representative Syria, um, you represent the, those five uh, largely rural counties, uh, just, just our neighbors, um, our neighbors close to us here in Austin. How has child care been impacted in these rural communities where, where family child care outside of a daycare center is, is more common? And, and in your opinion, um, how can the legislat legislature support the child care industry uh, to get the economy back up and running in these rural suburban areas? Now, obviously, uh, you know, with the public education, public schools, uh, you know, having virtual learning and the and kids having to come home and then 
those that had child care, uh, you know, having sent, trying to figure out where where they were going to have uh, their kids uh, stay during the day uh, while they're trying to go to work. I mean, it's just a it's a domino effect, obviously, that that we all saw, and you know, no different than uh, urban areas that we, of course, we were seeing it in rural areas, and and um, uh, it's it's one of those things that you just you, you kind of you kind of uh, I guess maybe take take advantage of or take uh, you, uh, you you feel like that it's always going to be there for you, but once you once you lose that piece of, of childcare or having the uh, kids being able to go somewhere and, and being looked after, it's, it, it was a domino effect of of those jobs. I also want to just uh, echo on uh, public education. You know, when we talk about last session and this session coming up, thank goodness we uh, we we did put put the uh, focus on public education. I, I want to give credit to Speaker Bond and Dennis Bonin for leading, leading that. You know, that was day one, we talked about public education and who would have thought that we would uh, be here today and, and be in a, such a, a, a tight spot with the budget and everything else that's going on. So hats off for everybody that worked so hard to get HB3 passed and for us to be able to uh, to, to set that, draw that line in the sand and be that, make that commitment. And I, and I I feel like, and, and Representative Harry mentioned it, you know, and I'm, I know we all feel the same way, is that, hey, we've, we've made this commitment, we're going to figure this out. And we also realize how important it is. You know, it's one of those things, once you start diving into it, you, you start looking at it. But child care, yes, it's it's uh, one of those big pieces that for our workforce and and, and people's lives that, that just got up upended. And, and uh, I know there's, I believe it's like $40 million that's being dedicated to help child care right now. Uh, from the state to uh, work work on uh, getting those those facilities and those uh, places uh, back up and running. So uh, no, it's a, it's definitely a, a, one of those pieces that we're going to have to help out and be aware of. And you know, a lot of families had to come together. And that's you know, again, that's another piece of all this is that families were working together to help other families and, and their children and and uh, making sure that everybody was able to get through this and continue to move forward with it. And I really, I just, I greatly appreciate the, the bipartisan efforts, um, you know, on, on not only public education, but, but these um, challenges that the childcare uh, facility industry is, is facing because, because I know that Texas families want to see that, uh, that conversation happening in a, in a bipartisan way because they, they need that support now. Um, regardless of, of, of who's champion it. So it's encouraging to see that here in this panel. You know, Representative Israel, um, COVID-19 shed further light on the economic disparities in our state. Of course, we know that, that too few workers can access the skills training and, and education needed to fill these in-demand jobs. Um, that, that we see in, in across the state. So talk to me a little bit about how the legislature will integrate child care and, and food insecurity and transportation and, and health care, these challenges into the higher education and workforce development conversations that you all will be having with the budget. Um, talk to me a little bit about how we can ensure that, that all Texans have the opportunity to, to build their skills and, and gain family sustaining wage jobs? Well, the, the beauty of the legislature is that we are, uh, it's, it's kind of a good and a bad, we're a part-time legislature. So, um, you know, as a, as a realtor, as a, as a member of the house who, who feels like I'm pretty connected to my district, um, the, the, my two colleagues here are excellent representatives of the house representatives. We, we bring all of that to bear in January and into the committees that we're working on. And we need to be, we need to not forget about those who are relying upon us to, to remember the average working women and men in our district. Um, and our economy in Texas is a very diverse economy. We, we, will, we will recover from this, but the economy of the future is gonna change. So we need to think in, in, in medium future terms um, predictions are that we're not going to do business the way we've done business. We're not going to work in offices the way we worked in offices. Um, think of a community like San Antonio that is so reliant on the tourism industry. Um, they're, they're taking a body blow. 
And if, and if your, your kid went to school to get a hotel management degree, good luck. Um, all of these structures are changing. So the state needs to be adaptive. And when it comes to uh, continuing education, vocational training, community colleges, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call it, we need to, we need to help that uh, person, whether they're 20 something or 40 something, um, recalibrate themselves. And there, there's a role for government to play to say, we can help you. We can help you say yes to your future. Um, so I, I think that we've got to think in terms of systemic structural change after a historic body blow to our economy. And, and we've, got to, we've got to respond uh, accordingly. And that means being connected to our districts, bringing that to bear. And we do tend to, um, we, get, we get involved in fights over social issues and division, but for the overwhelming, overwhelmingly, we agree on what's best, what's best for Texas. And um, the challenge is going to be the, the revenue to do that. Um, how are we going to find cost savings? Um, are we going to put in new revenue uh, to, to dedicate ourselves to that future Texas economy? Right, right. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I want to transition a little bit to advocacy because I know that there are, are so many um, volunteers who are, are really interested in um, and have long histories of, of advocating at the Capitol uh, for the United Way and for the, the issues um, that they care about here on this call. So I, being a, a former staffer in the House, um, I know how important it is to have those conversations with uh, advocates, volunteers, people who are, are coming um, to talk about the issues that they care about. So can, and I'd, I'd like to hear from all of you about how those, um, that's gonna change, you know, in, in this upcoming session. Um, you know, obviously we won't be able to have tons and tons of, of people um, you know, close together for lobby days in person. So if I could hear from, from each of you about um, the different, the ways that you're getting innovative on that so that we can, you can still hear from constituents across the state, I'd greatly appreciate it. How about Representative Israel? All right, well, I was gonna defer to, to, um, to Rep Howard, she's on the administrative, but let me, let me put in my, my, uh, my, my two cents on this is, um, as accessible as we're being to United Way today, um, we'll continue to be accessible to you. It just won't be in person. Um, and uh, the the Girl Scout troop with their germy little hands won't be <laughs> on the Capitol. Uh, sorry, it's going to be a different. It's still the people's house. It's just going to have to be different for a little while. Um, love those kids. They've been some of the best moments I've had on the house floor. But this is not the year for us to, to bring in, to start doing more exchanging of pods. <laughs> so, um, uh, we, but I know my office and my colleagues here, we're committed to Texas, we're committed to public service and we will be accessible to you. My best tip is um, stay engaged, stay on top of things. You don't have to, you can work smarter, not harder, follow your, those nonprofits who are tracking our progress. Raise Your Hand Texas comes to mind as a prominent advocate for public education. Um, but then when you're communicating with your state reps, um, make it personal. Tell us a little story, not too long, so that I know you're at the intersection of X and Y. This is my focus, and I would like your uh, uh, your help on this. So, um, and, and I suggest email because we, we won't misspell your name and we'll get your contact information. And all of that stuff is tracked. And when I vote on the House floor, my staff um, tallies all of that stuff and they'll say, you got six, six people from your district who were, who were asking for your support on this. So, so we really do track all of that information, but my best advice is just continue to be as real as you can and, um, and, and even in a digital format. Yeah. That's great. Representative Howard, you know, of course, yes, you're on the committee that's working through these processes. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that experience and, and what we can expect? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, unfortunately still uncertain to us, uh, to a degree because we don't know what to expect yet exactly, obviously, with uh, the spread of COVID. 
Um, the last that we have heard that our delegation in Travis County was uh, alerted to by Austin Public Health is that as early as this next week, we could move into the highest risk category. Um, and uh, the projections from the UT modeling, which looks at hospital admissions, hospital discharges, GPS movement, it's, it's a, a real robust uh, model that's been developed at UT, um, that they are projecting that we will be in this high, higher risk, uh, highest risk category up until and beyond the first day of session, which is January 12th, which poses a dilemma for us in terms of how do we safely gather. The Constitution requires that we gather to be sworn in at noon that day. If we don't get sworn in, there is no state legislature to oversee a budget <laughs> and make sure that we have funding uh, to support the programs that we are all counting on. Um, so somehow we're going to meet. And right now, the, uh, the, the temporary plan of the moment is that of 150 members on the House, now the Senate's different, and their Senate and House are trying to get in sync on this, but I know more about the House, of course, than the Senate. Uh, the 150 of, of us members would gather on the House floor our our seating arrangement is such that we aren't quite distanced by six feet, but approaching it. And you can certainly scoot your chairs over a tiny bit more. We want everybody to be masked. We want everybody to have a test before they come to the Capitol. Uh, do the best we can to, to, to limit the amount of time we're on the floor that day. Uh, but we are gonna need to vote on uh, electing a new speaker. And we're gonna need to vote on adopting some rules. We typically adopt uh, rules from the previous session as temporary rules, and then within the next several days have the debate on the new rules that we'll be having of, of how we operate. We want to have public access, so there will be, at this point in time, uh, access for some family members and public in the gallery, uh, access for a limited section for media in the gallery, uh, but it's going to be much more uh, limited than what we typically have where we're all kind of scrunched together. That's not going to happen. That can't happen. All that being said, though, it's still a large gathering in an enclosed space, though there have already been um, some safety precautions in terms of installing air purifiers, the same one that's used at MD Anderson, that is supposed to be uh, top of the line for keeping the air quality there. But Anyway, I can go on and on. This is the kind of thing everybody's having to look at. It's having to gather in schools. We've been expecting our schools to do this. So here we are at the legislature trying to figure that out. That's just the first day. We, we're trying to figure out how do we have committee hearings? How do we have public access? How do we take testimony? Is it only going to be virtual? Do we have some way for people to provide real time, real life uh, testimony? Uh, we don't know yet but we're putting plans in place, plexiglass in some of the committee hearing rooms, uh, one way in, one way out kind of thing, distancing where you would sit there, having some overflow rooms where you would also be distanced, having to have a test perhaps before you come into the Capitol. I mean, these are all the things we're trying to figure out. I will tell you, our bottom line is we want to make sure that the Capitol business can function in a safe way and that there's transparency and there is meaningful public access. How that's going to look remains to be determined. But as, as Celia was saying, you guys still can interact with us just like we're doing now. Most of us have been having regular Zoom meetings with constituencies. Uh, we'll, we'll still have those. We'll still have those opportunities. Um, and, and we want your input. But building coalitions, being better organized about how you do that thing is probably going to be more important this time when we have less opportunities for you to just drop by our offices. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Rep. Howard. You know, Rep. Sirie, um, you know, a lot of your constituents come in on, on buses, you know, for lobby days. How are you educating them to do things differently? Yeah, well, as mentioned, you know, obviously calls like this, we've, we've been on quite a bit of this, and quite frankly, it's been very effective. I mean, I think, you know, again, talking about opportunities and new ways of doing business and getting things done, this is this is going to be one of them. 
Uh, matter of fact, I have a call. We do a monthly call with my school superintendents. I have 23 school superintendents or ISDs that, that we work with, and I have a call this afternoon with them. And it's been it's been great because not only are we sharing, uh, you know, they're, they're giving me information, but it's obviously a chance for them to share information within our representative school through our, through our uh, district. Um, you know, I've, I've dealt with this quite a bit. Uh, in terms of the committee hearings and trying to get the capital open and, and figuring out ways to, for everybody to be safe and get our work done, just, you know, as mentioned, just like every other municipality has had to do uh, during this time period. We have uh, we just had, just a week ago, I had a, another sunset hearing. This time it was in the Reagan building. I think it's one of the first uh, hearings that's been had uh, in, in, a, in the capital complex, and especially with the, I call it dasher boards. It's like a hockey uh, it reminds me of a hockey uh, rink, but with the plexiglass, but we did a rapid test. We had, we had rapid tests done before uh, entering into the, uh, into the hearing room. And it was, it was very well done, very well thought through and, and can be done. We proved it. And one of the other big things was that we had virtual testimony. We originally back in August, we're going to do uh, public and every, you know, all, all the um, hearing uh, virtually, uh, we ended up uh, being asked to go through and just do an uh, invited testimony, which has been uh, very successful. Uh, and quite frankly, again, going back to uh, accessibility, I think it gives people more uh, access. We're very fortunate, uh, constituent-wise, being here in Central Texas because we're right next to the Capitol, and it's you know, you know, you're within 30 minutes usually of getting here. Whereas even some of my constituents, but those that are you know, scattered from y'all's hometown of El Paso, think about what it takes for them to come in. Uh, where I, during these uh, sunset hearings, I literally had one, we had the anatomical board that was up and I was talking to doctors from Galveston to Lubbock to San Antonio and they were in their offices and uh, uh, Donnie, you can appreciate these doctors, you know, couldn't take time away from their, you know, to travel to Austin to give us that testimony, which was desperately needed for us. But we were able to go right into their hospitals or right into their offices and get that that needed expertise uh, to our committee. So, uh, you know, there's ways of doing this, and I'm confident we, we can figure this out. But it will be different. And uh, I did, my suggestion has been, and it's always been, it doesn't matter if you're in a pandemic or not, is get to know your representatives, get to know your elected officials, local uh, and state, everybody. Uh, and Because it's really hard to, to build a relationship, especially during sessions. While we were getting pulled a million different directions, it's, it's you know, that time's a little bit hard to, to start getting your issues out or starting to ask those questions and things. So what we're doing today is a perfect example of what we should be doing during the interim and other times is just getting to know who we are and being able to get our phone numbers. I think we will be getting a lot of text messages more than usual from our constituents and people asking questions and things like that. But We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. It just will be uh, just a little bit different than usual. And like I said, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to pick up. It's an opportunity to, to uh, change for the better and, and make it more, more open uh, to the public. Yeah. We're all getting really familiar with the Zoom and Google Hangouts and all of those good ways that we can, we can communicate now. Well, thank you all so much for, for your time and insights. You know, I know that we've got some, uh, some great questions in the chat and a lot of people um, submitted questions ahead of time. Thank you so much. I wanna open it up for a little bit of Q&A and I apologize, we may not be able to, to get to every question but I want to start with the ones that were submitted early. We do have one for Representative Howard. Rep Howard, the Texas Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Review Committee released its biennial report with a few recommendations, including asking that state lawmakers increase access to comprehensive health services before, during, and after pregnancy specifically allowing Texas mothers to keep their Medicaid health insurance for a full year after childbirth. As the leader of the House Women's Health Caucus, we would love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, that is a, a fantastic committee with some amazing people on it, headed by Dr. Lisa Ollier, uh, who actually just recently came off being the national president of, of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Uh, she's been leading this group, doing the work that they're doing, and their recommendations are, are very similar to what they were the last time they did a report, uh, but a little more in depth now. Um, 
And, the, and as you mentioned, the bottom line is lack of access to care. Uh, when you have uh, women who do not qualify for Medicaid because right now Texas really only covers uh, uh, very, very poor people and so poor that it's like $3,000 a year. It's ridiculously low. Whatever it is, it's ridiculous. Um, and so if you're, a, if you're an adult under the age of 65 or you're not, you don't have a disability, then you're not covered. That's what we're talking about with Medicaid expansion, except when you're pregnant. And so when you're pregnant, we provide Medicaid coverage, but it ends two months after you deliver. Dr. Olier's group has clearly been recommending for a long time now that we expand that to at least one year postpartum. Many of the deaths and certainly the morbidities that occur are within that whole first year. And we could do, do a great service to Texas moms by ensuring that they have coverage for at least a year postpartum. Now, in an ideal world, we would cover the whole perinatal period, and then quite frankly, in my opinion, childbearing years. Um, we, have, uh, we know that women need to have uh, good health prior to getting pregnant. They need good prenatal care. And really, these women do not get into the Medicaid program oftentimes until after they're even through with the first trimester, which is such a critical part of, of fetal development. Um, so we really need to be finding ways to cover them even beyond the one year postpartum, but that's one of the primary recommendations. The other one I wanna quickly mention is a, a focus again on the uh, disparities and the disproportionate impact on women of color, in particular our black moms who have experienced um, much greater degrees of, of, of morbidity and mortality. Uh, we had a statewide um, Office of Minority Health, uh, and it was at once called, one, one time called the Elimination for Disproportionality and Disparities. That was eliminated in 2017. The funding wasn't there any longer. At, a very, at the very time when we needed to be focused on the dis, dis, disproportionate impact on our Black moms, and we've seen with COVID, the disproportionate impact on people of color from COVID. We're hoping that that will be reinstituted this next session, in terms of the extension of Medicaid coverage postpartum, there's probably like seven bills already that have been filed by different legislators about that. I think that, that we've got a lot of impetus toward that. I would like to see the entire Medicaid expansion happen, but if it's not gonna happen, then at least incrementally, we should be able to cover our Texas moms if we want them to be able to, have, to, to, to be healthy enough and alive to take care of their families. It's just critical. Um, so there's a lot more I could say about that, but those are two of the main things that I think we're going to be working on, and I'm hoping we're going to get a lot of bipartisan support for it. Yeah, and I feel like the conversation on Medicaid expansion has just uh, become more, more of a focus. I'm hearing more bipartisan um, conversations happening on, on Medicaid expansion. Rep. Syria, Rep. Israel, any, any, any thoughts on that and maybe moving the ball forward there? Well, uh, I, um, I have a bill, House Bill 389, which I call now recently the state of Missouri uh, expanded Medicaid. Uh, very conservative or moderate states like uh, Utah and Idaho have expanded Medicaid very recently, but it, they did it by referendum. So my bill would say, okay, take, take this to the voters and ask the voters, do you want more Texans covered? Do you want your federal dollars back? Um, and uh, so that's House Bill 389 is, is my answer. But I, I will note that um, Governor Abbott added an, a very important staffer recently, and that was our former colleague, Dr. John Zerwas, an anesthesiologist who before I got elected, I was a, I'm still a big admirer of his, but I was a, a big admirer of his from an outside because I look, here's a Republican anesthesiologist proposing Medicaid expansion. So I, I suspect that my Republican friends are, are recognizing that this is an important issue to the voters and we'll hopefully we can come up with something that will um, step up to the, to the moment that we're living in. Yeah, no, no question there's a paradigm shift going on, uh, just like many of these things. I mean, quite frankly, just even the short time that I've been in, uh, in the house for the last three sessions with uh, public education, uh, you know, where we went from uh, last session. So I, I think uh, top of mind awareness, I'll just repeat that, top of mind awareness definitely helps and healthcare is absolutely critical as we're going through this pandemic and 
watching everything that we're doing, uh, watching with uh, with all the, the work that's being done on the healthcare side. So no, I think it's uh, definitely a paradigm shift happening on, on that as well. That's great to hear. So, you know, with the, the limited time we have left, we have time for just one more question, you know, and, and, and from an audience member who submitted early, I, I want to talk about, you talked a little bit about rural um, broadband, access to internet, and we've talked about how that is so important for, um, you know, for folks to um, have financial st stability and access to, um, to opportunities. Uh, in addition to rural broadband, can you all think of other issues that, that you know, are just, it's going to be challenging for, for these issues to rise to the, the conversation because we are grappling with COVID and, and um, you know, the budget um, issues that, that may not get, the, get to see the conversation because of that. I'll start. On, on education or on in general? Uh, in general that we won't get to we won't that we may not get to because we're going to be <laughs> well you know we're going to take care of everything Laura. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know we have huge issues to deal with this session uh in terms of a budget uh in terms of covid uh in terms of uh redistricting and uh we did not talk about that and we don't have much time now for that but just to say that we're required to, to draw the lines uh, for uh, the, the House, the Senate, the State Board of Education, and our congressional districts. Uh, but we need to have census data, which I know United Way is, well, is very familiar with, uh, with that issue, and we are, we're not going to have it in a, in a timely fashion. So we're being told that that could be pushed into a, a special session in, in the summer. Uh, we don't really know what to expect there, but, uh, you know, there, there's even talk now in terms of the House lines being uh, drawn in the following legislative session two years from now. So a lot of that is, is going to be real challenging to figure out how we're going to address that. And that is very much related to COVID, which has impacted our getting the data that we need to draw those lines. Yeah, and I, uh, just on that, I'll read this I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that it is in, uh, you know, in a special session because we do need to focus on so many other things and not being, you know, I was a county commissioner during the time, the last uh, uh, redistricting, and I know what a distraction it is. And I know, you know, we've heard, heard the stories and some have been through it, but uh, I'm, you know, I'm hearing it looks looks very probable uh, that, you know, it will be in, the, in a special, special session, but I, you know, I, one of the things too that, you know, I, it was kind of funny when you were saying, hey, what are we not going to get to? I, it just doesn't seem to me, it's like, we got to get to all this. We, we need to have these conversations. Uh, one of the things that I'm seeing and we're working on, it's one of the agencies that's up for uh, Sunset right now is Texas Commission on Law Enforcement. Obviously talking about top of mind awareness. Um, you know, they were last reviewed, I guess it was 10, 12 years ago uh, when they went through a review and Quite frankly, it's it's been uh, uh, universal uh, that that there is a lot of work that needs to be done with our law enforcement and just just the basic requirements that that we have from a state. Uh, matter of fact, state of Texas is only one of two, and and that uh, with Hawaii and, and minimum requirements for our law enforcement and our peace officers. So, uh, what we have seen is uh, I, this is also very similar to what to what we went through on public education, which it is a very bipartisan issue. We all care about uh, uh, law enforcement and, and seeing the issues that, we've, that have happened over the summer and, and what has been progressively getting worse. And so uh, this is, to me is a great opportunity this session is to focus on this uh, sunset bill, which is uh, the overriding uh, group that's on uh, law enforcement. Uh, and what I'm calling is modernization of Texas law enforcement, uh, because we are way behind, as we all know, on training. And quite frankly, it, it has to deal with uh, funding. We haven't put the support and the backing that we needed to do over these years uh, for our law enforcement. Um, so uh, look, I would say, uh, look, look, look for that too, this, uh, this session. I'm encouraged by, by all of you that you're gonna, 
you're going to tackle all the issues. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for, for that. And, and, you know, thank you for being here, um, speaking from experience. I know how busy you and your offices are right now. So thank you for, for giving us this hour to, um, to give us a glimpse of what to expect. And, and I know that this, this group of people is looking forward to uh, speaking with you in, in whatever creative ways we can this upcoming session. Um, I know that there, for those of you who are interested in, in staying involved on the advocacy front with the United Way, I know there's going to be a, a link in the the, the chat box that you can click on to make sure that you're getting updates. Um, and until we can gather again, uh, you know, safely in person, um, we, we look forward to keeping the conversation going. Thank you so much to Jennifer Woods. Uh, happy birthday to Jennifer. And thank you to the entire United Way team um, for, for your help. And we'll see you again soon.